Oral questions by members? Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, as bombardments killed dozens of Ukrainian civilians, the International Criminal Court opened inve an investigation against Russia for war crimes. British Columbians have been clear. They want no part in supporting Putin's invasion of Ukraine or war crimes against civilians. That's why the mixed messages that we heard yesterday from the Premier were so disappointing. On one hand, the Premier said it was entirely up to the pension fund, where taxpayer money was invested, even if that was Russian companies supporting the war effort. And then the Premier said, and I quote, we will certainly be following up with BCIMC, end quote. Simple question, did the Premier make the call to BCIMC as he promised yesterday? Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and I join with the member and all members of this House um, and stand with the people of Ukraine against the, uh, the Ill illegal uh, invasion uh, um, that, that Russia is perpetrating on the people of Ukraine. I, I can't imagine anybody in this House not standing, uh, not standing up with all of us. And I, and I do want to say, Mr. Speaker, that I so admire the courage that I've been witnessing on the news of, of the people of Ukraine and in everybody in Canada standing united, and in fact, around the globe. Uh, from day one, Mr. Speaker, we have been working with Ottawa to, to uh, support coordinated uh, federal sanctions. Um, and what I can share with the member is that uh, we, um, that, and, and our position has been made clear as a government, uh, we are going to continue to work actively with Ottawa. Uh, and, and, and BCI uh, did hear the position I, I, of this House, of every single member of this House. Uh, and I have been made aware that they are now reaching out to talk with their clients today. Leader of the Official Opposition, Supplemental. Well, that answer falls so far short. The Minister knows full well that she is the sole shareholder. In fact, she also appoints members to the board. Members to the board of directors. This Finance Minister has absolutely every opportunity to outline the mandate. What appropriate investments look like. The Premier said he would call. The Minister avoided answering that question. Leadership is about moving quickly in a crisis. And while the Minister and the Premier might claim that they can't do anything, he was the one who yesterday said he would call BCIMC. The Minister of Finance knows that jurisdictions around the world have moved quickly. Let's look at the list. Quebec, New York, California, and this morning, our neighbor, Alberta, apparently figured out how to do this. Because guess what? Their pension fund announced this morning that they are pulling out. British Columbians, in times like these, expect the Premier to act and to act quickly. So once again, to the finance minister, the sole shareholder, the person who has the opportunity to shape the mandate, will she do the right thing? Did the premier make the call he promised to? British Columbians expect action, and they expect it now. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, you know, and, and, I, and I know actually that uh, the new leader um, of, of the opposition, Kevin Falcon, um, has already stated, in fact, publicly, that he understands the, the limitations of, the, of the, the legal opportunity to, to step in and, and redirect BC, uh, BCI uh, Management Corporation. Um, and the member also knows full well that, uh, that you can only um, act on what you are legally able to act. But I also want to assure the member that we've heard from BCI Management Corporation that they are taking action. They are engaging with their members, uh, with, with their clients. They're engaging with them, their clients today in order to make the right decisions uh, on behalf of their clients, Mr. Speaker. And I think that's uh, a good action. I think that's quick action. And, um, and I look forward to seeing how they, make, how they move forward um, on this. Leader of the Official Opposition, second supplemental. Well, with all due respect to the Finance Minister, it's simply not good enough. Here, here.
First, it was they're not going to take action. Now it's maybe they're going to take action. Now it's they're going to talk to their, to, their, uh, share, to their members. The finance minister is the sole shareholder. British Columbians have spoken with their hearts, with their voices. They do not want to support anything that contributes to the attacks that are taking place on Ukraine. We may be a small jurisdiction, but it is important that we do absolutely everything we can. And this is something that this minister and this premier can do and should do. So again, to the Minister of Finance, what specific action will be taken to ensure that those funds are divested? Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I, again, uh, the member doesn't seem to understand that, that, that I am legislatively prohibited from being involved in investment decisions. For, for, members, for, for, members, for, for members, no back and forth, the please. The CEO and the CIO is accountable for all investment decisions, and, they, and Alberta has different legislation, Mr. Speaker. So, again, uh, we have heard from uh, the, those who are responsible for making these decisions that they are going to be taking action, Mr. Speaker. But again, I want to let the member know that, that as a government, we, have, uh, we, we are continuing to to identify ways uh, to make our voices known uh, to, in, the, in the global world about uh, this, uh, this, incur this illegal incursion into Ukraine. Last week, I asked staff to look into land ownership records related to Russian oligarchs, Mr. Speaker, Members, so that we can make answer, sure that, that we are doing everything that we can bring to bear on this uh, situation. Member for Skina. Mr. Speaker, there's no doubt that British Columbia is united in terms of condemning Russia on its attack on Ukraine, and yet this BC government doesn't want to do anything about it. Yesterday, the Premier wrote off any contribution from BC's clean and ethical LNG industry by saying, and I quote, if we could do it tomorrow, that would be one thing, but we can't. The best efforts of British Columbians would not achieve what you're asking for in three, four, or five years. End quote. That is disrespectful to the thousands of workers, First Nations, and communities who continue to rally around the LNG industry in BC, especially in this time of world global energy crisis. Democracies across Europe and the world have all recognized the importance of this energy shift, of this energy crisis, especially Germany, everybody around the world except BC. So my question is to the Premier. Why isn't the Premier acting now to increase BC's LNG production to help this energy crisis? Minister of Energy and Mines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for the question. Uh, clearly, the war in Ukraine has completely ro uh, roiled and upset energy markets around the world. There's no doubt about that. In fact, uh, this morning, the International Energy Agency and the uh, United States government, among other major oil producers, have released 60 million barrels from their reserves to try to put a stop to the rise in prices. So, there are a number of steps being taken around the world to deal with energy markets. What the, what the Premier said yesterday, and I, we value the, the LNG uh, industry here, uh, it, it's uh, meeting our four conditions, including our climate targets, uh, but the, uh, the, what the Premier said uh, yesterday is, is the fact. Uh, one can, with all the best wishes and sentiments uh, in the world, not uh, produce an additional uh, increment of LNG given where the development process of LNG Canada, the leading company, is right now. They're in the middle of a, it's a $40 billion project. They're halfway through the construction of the project and wishing that they could uh, contribute, contribute to uh, uh, LNG markets is just not uh, feasible at this point, despite the very the sentiment that the, me the member expresses. So I, I don't disagree 
with the, with the premise of the question that more LNG is welcome in the global markets right now, particularly in Europe. But British Columbia, given the state of construction, uh, can't contribute uh, today or tomorrow, but will in the future. Member for Skeena Supplemental. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. And uh, with all due respect, this is not about prices. This is not about the market. This is about the invasion of Ukraine. This is about the dependence of Europe on Russia energy, specifically oil and gas. It's got nothing to do with market and prices. This is about a war. And everybody around the world is contributing, except BC. There are seven LNG projects on the books right now waiting for permits. Yeah. LNG Canada was actually proposed for four trains. There's only two trains approved. BC can fast track those additional two trains right now. There has been a huge shift in the global energy world, and BC needs to rise to the challenge. It's a moral duty. It's got nothing to do with prices or market. Excuse me. What did you say? What did you say? Of drinking? Members, drinking? members. Did you say Member for drinking? Skina has the floor. You need to withdraw. You asked him what he was drinking. I also withdraw. Members. Members will come to order. Member for Skina will continue. Instead of working so our LNG can help reduce the world's reliance on Russian exports, the Premier said, and I quote, I think the better role for British Columbians to play is to say to the international community, we are all in this together, end quote. Well, the only way we can be in this together with our European allies in this crisis is if BC helps supply world energy needs with clean and LNG because holding hands and playing nice will not stop Russian aggression. It won't address the global demand for energy, especially in Germany and Europe. And like we said yesterday, Vladimir Putin isn't going anywhere. My question to the Premier, why isn't the Premier out there right now seizing the massive new need for our province's abundant, clean and ethical natural gas? Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it, it, it is related to markets. Uh, Germany cancelled their license for Nord Stream 2, the doubling of the flow of uh, gas, natural gas, from Russia to Germany. That, that ended uh, very suddenly. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a huge supply gap which has to be filled. But the member mentions uh, LNG Canada, LNG Canada Phase 2. That's a decision. It's not a state-owned company. The, uh, the consortium, led by Shell, has to make a decision to go forward. Um, and as of today, I have not received a request from Shell to, to make that decision. Members, so, um, order. It, that, that's something that uh, is in the hands of the investors in Shell, their board, and, and, uh, and they've made some, Shell has made some major moves globally but they have not made that particular move and they would have to consult with their consortium. So the opportunity is there. Uh, we are willing to work with them if they choose to come forward, uh, providing that the, the project would fit within our, our climate action plan. So, so that's, that's where that, that particular uh, suggestion sits at the moment. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. There's times when I try to describe to people what it's like to be in this chamber and how it feels like we're in a reality that doesn't exist outside of this building. And today is that experience. Yesterday, 
The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a report on the worsening climate crisis. The report clearly states that any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called the report, quote, an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of the failed climate leadership. And we are arguing about which party is more supportive of liquefied natural gas based on fracking in this chamber today. <laughs> As though somehow we could export natural gas to Europe. The logistical fallacies aside, building more emission-intensive fossil fuel development, which is hazardous to human health and exacerbates the climate crisis, cannot be seen as an answer in 2022. It will not, intensifying climate change will not address the current war in Europe. If anything, it will exacerbate global conflict. We've seen it in BC and around the world this year. Climate disasters displace thousands of people, destroy communities, and diminish food and water security. Through you, Honourable Speaker, to the Premier, We've had fires, flood, deadly heat dome. We've spent billions repairing damaged infrastructure, and yet we do not see the political will to treat climate change like the existential threat that it is. In light of the IPCC report, how can this Premier continue to advocate for an increase to our emissions after the climate disasters of 2021? Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, and everybody on this side of the House, and I hope everybody on both sides of the House, pays heed to not only what British Columbians experienced throughout 2021, but also to what people around the world experienced throughout 2021, and the warnings that we get from scientists about the increasing threats of climate change, the increasing impacts of climate change, the need to prepare and adapt to what we are experiencing and what we know we will experience more of, and also, Honourable Speaker, to invest significantly in a broad range of programs to reduce emissions through every part of our economy, through our homes, through our buildings, through our communities, and through our transportation systems. And that, Honourable Speaker, is exactly what we are continuing to do, not just in this budget, but in three budgets before this one. This year, we have added $1.2 billion in emission reduction Clean BC programs. <laughs> to the $2.3 billion that we had already invested. On top of that, Honourable Speaker, for climate preparedness, we have budgeted $2.1 billion dollars to protect people from climate disasters and to build back better, including $83 million in a climate preparedness and adaptation strategy to ensure that we have the information and data that we need to protect British Columbians. This, Honourable Speaker, is not an easy task either on the mitigation or the preparedness side. It is multi-leveled. It is across government. It's through every ministry. There are literally dozens of programs, and it will involve everyone, and we're committed to continue that work. Leader of Third Party Supplemental. It's fascinating, Honourable Speaker, the position of these two ministers on the benches, because they are advocating for the opposite. On the one hand, billions spent to try to reduce the effects of climate change, and on the other hand, billions poured in in public money and subsidies to keep building those emissions. Ramp up production. This is a contradiction that this government has not reconciled oh. Ramp it up. and continues to pretend that words are enough 
that facts and data and evidence don't matter. The thing that we're leading in in BC is our rising emissions year over year. Svetlana Krakowska, who headed Ukraine's delegation to the UN, said yesterday that, quote, human-induced climate change and the war on Ukraine have the same roots, fossil fuels, and their dependence on them. It is, I'm sure, Honourable Speaker, you can recognize an understatement to say that I am disappointed by the discourse in this chamber. Climate delay, pretending that we can continue to build fossil fuel infrastructure and call ourselves climate leaders, that is the new climate change denial. Mm -hmm. We are out of time. The IPCC report is clear. Mm -hmm. Framing increased fossil fuel development as an answer to war is something that I could not have imagined would be happening in this chamber in this year. And yet here we are. Through you, Honourable Speaker, again to the Premier. How does he square claiming to act on the climate crisis while advocating and subsidizing the single largest source of climate emissions in BC history, which relies on a massive increase of methane-intensive fracking in the Northeast? Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. And I'll simply repeat, we have developed on this side of the House a multifaceted emission reduction climate action plan, which the member knows because the member and her former colleague in the Green Party, Andrew Weaver, and her current uh, colleague were very much a part of designing that program. But, Honourable Speaker, to assume that the answer to climate change is as easy as flicking a light switch is neither correct nor doable. We all know that we are in a transition. We all know that over time we are transitioning to clean energy, renewable energy, and we need to do that as quickly as possible. In the meantime, Honourable Speaker, I will simply repeat. We have invested heavily in Clean BC. We have a range of measures, including investing in active transportation, including setting standards for zero carbon buildings, including putting a cap on natural gas utilities, including a commitment to work with industry, Indigenous people and experts to reduce emissions from oil and gas by 33 per cent by 2030. These are targets. These are commitments, these are statements, that's what our government is working on and that's what we'll continue to work on because we know we have a responsibility to British Columbians and we know we have a responsibility to work with other jurisdictions around the world to take action as quickly as possible. We all need to do that, not just in this government or in this house or in this province, but globally. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, our questions yesterday and today are shining a bright light on this complete lack of action by this Premier, lack of leadership by this Premier. Yesterday, the Premier said he was going to phone about the pensions. Didn't phone. Minister won't confirm that any phone calls went. In fact, they're just getting some back channel conversation instead of an actual direct phone call, instead of actually showing some leadership. The minister responsible for permitting hasn't made any phone calls around our LNG product projects that are sitting, waiting for permits. But let's look at what real action actually looks like, real leadership looks like. Let's look to Germany, who's trying to free themselves of being dependent on Russia for energy at a time when Russia has declared war on Ukraine. It's not an incursion, it's war, plain and simple. What did Germany do? They shut down a pipeline that was already built for their energy needs from Russia and have expediated, fast-tracked two import terminals for LNG so they can source LNG from somewhere else in the world to not rely on a dictator in Russia for their energy needs. 
And yes, it'll take a couple years to build those import terminals. You know what else will take a couple years to build? The facilities to supply those import terminals. But that's not going to happen if this government doesn't actually take any action and can't be bothered to pick up the phone to see what they can do to move permitting along. So to the minister, has he made even one phone call to any of the permits that are outstanding to any of the companies trying to do LNG expansion in British Columbia to see if we can actually play a meaningful part in what is going on in world events? Minister of Energy and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I regularly receive reports on the progress of, of the LNG Canada project. Uh, it is proceeding. Uh, the, the gas pipeline is proceeding, although I think we're all aware of some of the challenges that face that particular piece of construction. And those projects are moving forward. As the member says, uh, the expectation of a Completion date is, is at least several years away, notwithstanding the best efforts of a very skilled uh, and strong leadership and the workforce uh, of a diverse, uh, well-skilled uh, in, in the Northwest. So that, that, uh, that those steps are taking place. Uh, and uh, when those LNG terminals in Germany are, are available, I, I doubt that there will be direct supply uh, to uh, Europe because uh, uh, most of the, the production is spoken for uh, in long-term contracts on the other side of the Pacific. So um, I, 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 uh, I think that uh, that, that is the current uh, reality of uh, that, that particular project. Member for Abbotsford West. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think it is the lack of urgency that we are hearing from the minister, from the government and the premier that is particularly disappointing and, and troubling. At a time of crisis, Mr. Speaker, I think people are entitled to expect leadership from the government, but they're entitled to expect proactive leadership not the kind of passive response that we are, we are seeing here. The, the minister says to the House, well, no one has called me, the proponents haven't called me. The minister knows that every signal LNG Canada and these other proponents of LNG have received from this government is don't bother applying. He knows that. And so to stand in the House today in the, in the shadow of an invasion, in the shadow of a world crisis, and say, well, they, they can call. The world is watching, and what they're hearing from British Columbia, sadly, Mr. Speaker, is all the right words, and no action. No meaningful action. Others have said it. Vladimir Putin isn't going away. He is going to wield this energy club to intimidate nations, democracies in Europe and elsewhere around the world. It is not a three-week issue. It is at least a decade-long issue. And to suggest that British Columbia cannot be part of the response to Vladimir Putin because it takes a few years to build an LNG plant is simply avoiding the issue, Mr. Speaker. If the Attorney General doesn't know what the question is, then we're really in trouble, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. Surely it is obvious to him and every member of this government that the question is, why won't the government take proactive steps to demonstrate to the world that British Columbia stands with the Ukraine and will help to fill the energy gap that five years Solicitor General, Government House Leader. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. We are.
this country and the world has condemned the invasion of Ukraine, a sovereign nation. A country I have visited on three different occasions and had a chance to meet and work with people there. Right from the beginning, this government has stood on the side of Ukraine with the federal government right from the beginning that takes the first leadership role in terms of sanctions and how we deal with that aggressive, unwarranted attack on a sovereign nation. This province took leadership starting with liquor stores, with gaming. Members. Members, order. All members. Minister will continue. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. It's unfortunate that what we're seeing is an effort to politicize what is a terrible. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. What is shameful, Honourable Member, is attempting to politicize the situation. And we have been members will come to order. And you have been getting answers that Leader of the Official Opposition, please. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. As I was about to say, yesterday the, made it, the, the Premier made it clear that this House does not agree with having investments in Russia, that that message would be sent to the Investment Corporation loud and clear, that they will make those decisions based on the rule of law, which is not about politicians meddling, but we've sent that clear message the finance minister stated today that the, the investment corporation is taking action, honourable speaker. That is how it should be done. At the same time, minister. thank you, honourable speaker. At the same time, the uh, minister of energy has made it clear. Members, please. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I think the comments from the other side make it clear that they're not really interested in getting information. And there has been lots of action, and there will be lots more action to, 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 to come, Honourable Speaker. But let's be clear. Minister, continue. The only sideline, Honourable Speaker, is the sideline that you're sitting on over there. And given your display today, you'll be sitting over there for a long time.